All set? Good to go? Ready for blast off? Lift off? Ready to go home. Ready to go home. We just got started. Hold on now. I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> so Isaiah's been a really exciting uh, book, but kind of heavy <laughs> up to this point. We've been overwhelmed with the woes and the woes where we, uh, like Isaiah in chapter 6, finally said, Woe is me! <laughs> right? And saying all of these woes, pronouncing woes on whole nations, on whole uh, different areas there. But in, in uh, chapter 40, it's kind of interesting, and some have uh, called it kind of, um, I guess lightly, you can refer to Isaiah um, as a miniature Bible. Um, there's 66 books in the Bible. There's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. And the reason I say we kind of take these things lightly is the chapters, uh, divisions, weren't inspired in any way by the Holy Spirit. We know that. It was just one long scroll before. But it's interesting how when you do divide it up and you see 39 of these chapters, the first 39 chapters in Isaiah is a lot like the first 39 books of the Bible, the Old Testament, to where we have judgment, harsh punishment on certain sections and, and places in the world. And then chapter 40, as we come into this new section, is like the next 27 chapters we'll see is like the 27 chapters in the New Testament. In that we see Jesus Christ, a lot more of Him shows up, and specifically His first coming. We've already looked quite a bit at some of the prophecies concerning His second coming, but here as we get into this, we'll get into especially the most famous Isaiah 53 passage, and it really depicts and looks at Jesus Christ on the cross, His suffering, His, his death, um, and how it was all spoken of. It was all uh, fulfilled as He came. Um, and so powerful stuff. Um, and take that for what it is. Don't, don't uh, have to be dogmatic about that, but it's just kind of interesting. There are 66 books in the Bible, and um, Isaiah kind of just has that, that feel of the, the Old Testament. So much so that people have come up with some false teachings. <laughs> And just like they run into uh, the Pentateuch with Moses being the author of uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, people have a hard time accepting that <laughs> for some reason. Um, they do the same thing here because there is such a difference in style that historians and that people that call themselves biblical scholars have, have come to the conclusion there was two Isaiahs. And the, uh, the, you've probably heard of the Deuter Isaiah, just two different uh, guys with the same name, Isaiah, and being two different authors of this book. It's total nonsense. There's no reason to believe any of that. Um, and my source, just like Moses, being the author of the first five books, and same source is Jesus Christ. He uh, attributed... Isaiah chapter uh, 60, I think it is, and Isaiah chapter 6 to the same author. Um, and you're going to run into all kinds of these different things, and John chapter 12 could be the homework assignment there to kind of track that down and see how Jesus attributes, maybe it's not, it's, it's one of these later chapters in Isaiah and Isaiah 6, and it's the same author, same guy. And I always want to follow up with that with, with it doesn't matter which human God chose. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world if there were two Isaiahs here. It's just we don't want to accept any uh, man's authority over Jesus Christ and His authority. Uh, ultimately, He's the author. <laughs> he knows. But you'll, you'll hear and see the difference in writing, the difference in styles, like I said, so much so that people uh, take it too far and stretch it 
and say, oh, it's got to be two different authors. Um, uh, no, it's the same here. But he turns from low, <laughs> turns from really heavy and devastating things to verse 1, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. You thought I'd never get there. <laughs> comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God, and speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned or forgiven. For she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now the way that's worded at the end of verse 2 can be confusing. And really, it's literally translated there where it says uh, uh, receiving double for all her sins. It could be the debts have been paid for, for the sins. Kind of repeating what he says there earlier, that her iniquity is pardoned. It's reiterating that same idea that all debts are paid for. And so, again, we're entering into a new, a new section here, especially as, as uh, well, Isaiah is being called to comfort now the people and comfort them, speaking to Jerusalem specifically how the Lord has pardoned them and the warfare is accomplished. No more of this, uh, well the heaviness that we've been reading about as far as uh, coming down on them, um, pronouncing woes on Judah and all of those things that we have looked at. Um, another difference I meant to bring up is chapters 1 through 39. The first 39 chapters is Assyrian. Uh, threats of Assyria coming, which we know came to pass, and it's now going to change to Babylon. So from 40 now to the end of the book, chapters 40 through 66, is now Babylon. It's, it's going to focus on the area of Babylon, which is really huge. And another reason they try and say this is another author um, is that it's 150-some years before Babylon even rises and comes on the scene. Assyria had already been on the scene. And at the time that Isaiah is writing this, the Assyrians were the threat. But Babylon hadn't even been thought of until Daniel, until we get to the days of Daniel. But, um, and so, again, they, they underestimate God and His infinite wisdom, right? Uh, as if that was any kind of trouble for God to try and uh, get around. But it's Babylon that gets, uh, that gets the focus is going to shift. Not in this chapter, but once we get back to um, kind of the judgment, the, the things that are coming. So, here, um, Jerusalem is, is uh, comforted. Um, how are they going to be comforted? Verse 3, The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. I wish that would be true of the people. <laughs> right? The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. <laughs> and the glory of the Lord shall be re revealed, and all flesh shall see it, shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So, this verse 3 through 5 here is obviously, and uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 3 could be the, the uh, scripture to jot down there because uh, John the Baptist is the one. Um, and I love that he's described, and in John 1, in John 1 23, he actually describes himself as the voice, <laughs> a voice. Of one crying, I'm just a voice, and he was. He was called to prepare the way of the Lord. What does that mean? When you looked out at Jerusalem, if you if you will, a picture that could be seen here, you looked over Israel. There would be some who believed and saw themselves as high-minded, um, very educated, even wore big hats with big. What do they call those? Uh, the boxes. Phylacteries. Phylacteries, yes. 
and big uh, sashes and, and uh, all of their get-ups and kind of walked with this high mind. And then you had in the same area here in Israel, in Jerusalem, prostitutes, beggars, blind, lame, very low to the ground, humiliated people that got spit on daily. So you had some crooked paths. You had these high-minded, right? And you had these low areas where you could trip over them, in little ditches and stuff. And John the Baptist came with a, with a message, didn't he? And it was very simple, one word, repent. And that repent, that one word he elaborated on much of, <laughs> and making way, he, he made flat that, that, that whole thing, where it don't matter how much education you have when Jesus shows up. How many of you know? It doesn't matter how poor, how much of a beggar you are. Jesus comes along and lifts them up, but in the same time, he cuts the high-minded down. And you will not, you'll miss him if you don't be humble. Because you, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. But I love the sight there. I love the picture there of really what John's calling was. And Jesus said, among women, there, uh, among men born of women, there was none greater than John the Baptist. And I believe that it was that uh, somebody said he was the greater. And this might have been J. Vernon. The, the greater, G-R-A-D-E-R. -E he would come and grade that road that was so rough. And, you know, it makes its little pun there. A little fun, <laughs> fun with words. But he is the greater that came and made it straight. You love when you come onto those roads that are freshly graded, right? And that's what John did. Making straight the way of the Lord. So... And the voice said, now verse 6 goes on, and this could actually be a voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? <laughs> Answering all the same question here. You know, what, what do you want to cry? What shall I cry? Verse 6 goes on, all flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass wherewith the flower fades, because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. We just sang, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. There's the title of our message for tonight. Stand forever. That's, you know, people come and go. Things come and go. Uh, football teams come and go. And they have some glory for a moment. Look kind of pretty. <coughs> look real tough. Just like nations, just like Assyria, just like Babylon, just like uh, all of the, the great power, you know, national powers over the centuries that we've seen, they come and they go. But the Word of God stands forever. Nothing, and we're going to see, nothing compares to it. I love this chapter. This is powerful stuff. You know, I'll be amazed if we get through the whole chapter tonight. It's really, there's a whole lot that can be said just in that. The grass withers. And, and the, the reminder that we are like grass. Every one of us. We're like flowers. And you're not going to stay alive forever. That's the idea there. You know, it doesn't matter how much water you, you give it. <laughs> you're not going to be alive forever. Remember that with Valentine's Day. Right, right around the corner. The flowers will just die. Not, I'm not saying don't get flowers, but remember, they're, they're not going to last forever. But God's Word does. You know, we, we still look at, at the things that Abraham said, the things that Moses said, the things that Isaiah's saying, because they were it's the Word of God. Nothing to do with them. <laughs> Read Hebrews 11. Had nothing to do with these men and how great they were. But it was everything to do with God's Word being, being uh, written on their hearts and written through them. So, O Zion, now back to Jerusalem here. God's strong hand. O Zion, that brings good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountains. 
O oh, Jerusalem, thou that brings bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto them, unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His work before Him. In fact, if you're wondering who that God is, and, and that word behold literally is look for yourself. See for yourself who your God is. And verse 11 describes it perfectly. He shall feed His flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with His arms or literally carry them in His bosom or over His heart and shall gently lead those that are with young. Does that not perfectly describe Jesus Christ, our Lord? Not only the good shepherd, John chapter 10, verse 11, He's the good shepherd, John 10, 11, but the great shepherd, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. The great shepherd, Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. But it doesn't stop there. He's the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5, 4. That means the greatest, the chief among them. Remember Paul the Apostle that put the negative on it, said, I'm the chief sinner. That's the idea here with the shepherd. He is the perfect shepherd. In fact, it's, it's hard to get used to a pastor uh, when people call them shepherds. And my dad used to be quick to point out, there is one good shepherd. There's only one shepherd truly of the church. Now he calls some to be pastors and it's, it's the idea of taking care of the flock. But Jesus is our example and He gently leads those. And He carries them over His heart. He, he has them always on His mind. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's important that we remember the good tidings that we read in verses 9 and 10 is literally the same word for the Gospel. It's the same word. <laughs> good tidings, and what does the Gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Where? comes from where? Jerusalem. In fact, the gospel message came first from and came out of Jerusalem in the physical sense. The gospel message or the good news. What is the gospel? What is the good news? Jesus Christ died. He was buried. And He was put in that tomb. But that's not where it ends. I always love the saying, he could all, the only one that could treat the tomb like a hotel room, only needed for the weekend. It's really true. He rose again, three days. Rose on that Sunday morning. And um, that's the good news. And it began there in Jerusalem. And again, um, specifically, cities of Judah specifically where Jesus Christ would come and be born and would be raised up and become that John chapter 10 good shepherd. But it goes even further than that. How big really is this God? <laughs> if you're going to behold your God, the living God, you better be ready for verse 12 through 17 here. This is why I don't know if we'll finish tonight. <laughs> who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hands and meted out heaven, that is measuring heaven with the span, that is with your hands. A span is from your pinky, the tip of your pinky to your wrist. God fits that in his hand, the heavens that you and I look at. <laughs> and comprehended, who again has comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Answer, only one. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or who, uh, being His counselor, has taught Him? I love this. Can God learn anything? Can anyone teach God anything? We try sometimes in our prayers. <clears throat> 
and it's foolish, we should always remember these verses when we're, when we're going to the Lord in prayer. Because oftentimes we can demand things from God. We can kind of, uh, you better do this because I, you know, and get into these, these kind of discussions. Who, with whom took he counsel, verse 14, and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? Look, behold, <laughs> the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he takes up the islands, the isles, as a very little thing. And Lebanon, which had those huge trees and, and was known for... Is, it, even Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. And that was like the forest, the main forest. God's kind of giving them a picture here. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing. And vanity, vanity, empty, completely meaningless in his sight. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher, he's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. He's the only one who measures the water and, and uh, even measures out the heavens. Um, in fact, there has been some, and, and always will be, those that attempt. NASA, we know, has attempted to truly measure the heavens. Measure. And you know what's scary? <laughs> Is they found that it's finite. In other words, it's not infinite, which they have a hard time grasping. They have a hard time coming to grips with that. You mean it's finite? That tells me there's a beginning, which tells me there's a beginner. And that they've, for a long, long time, they've been trying to, and they'll, they'll even come up with books that say the infinite universe or don't, don't read it. Don't believe it. <laughs> it is finite. The most brilliant minds have dug in and found, <laughs> and it's scary, because they understand. A lot of them don't believe in God, but they understand this thing has a beginner. It's finite. It means <laughs> it's um, way bigger than any of us, but there is a beginner. So, um, and it really is does give us an accurate picture of God when you think of His palm, His hand holding the heavens. I mean, He holds all things together. Um, I love the way Romans chapter 11, verse 33, I couldn't read that without thinking of Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and on. It's the setup. Um, this is the setup for, I think, one of our favorite verses, right? Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, how His ways are past finding out. For who has ever known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Who has first given to Him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Looking at that, that you know, we've heard that verse, Romans 12, 1, probably quite a bit in church. But the, the setup before that, when you really start to, when you stop and understand it, it's a reasonable service, isn't it? It's the depths of his knowledge, his wisdom, his power. Why wouldn't you surrender your body as a living sacrifice, right? Um, so um, it, it's, it's grasping this and seeing. Um, how big God is. I, the other verse that came to mind 
after reading this. Who has taught you? You know, who has taught? I love Job chapter 38. The whole chapter in its entirety, Job 38, is so powerful because it's God's response. God comes and speaks and answers Job, finally. And one, among those things, we all know, Job 38, among those things he says, where were you? When I framed the foundations of the world, where were you, Job? <laughs> Same idea here. Can, can you teach me? Can, you, can the Lord be taught ever? <laughs> Why is God talking like this, right? <laughs> um, all nations before Him are as nothing. They are counted to Him less than nothing and vanity. Now the Assyrians, the Babylonians eventually, would think of themselves as, you better watch out. <laughs> We're tough, large and in charge. In fact, there will come a day, Psalm chapter 2. There will come a day, I love this, Psalm 2, verse 2. The Messianic Psalm. Psalm 2, verse 2 says, The kings of the earth gather themselves together, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Who's His anointed? Jesus Christ. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords, cords from us. He who sits in heavens laugh, shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. It's no match. But all of the nations before Him are as nothing. Just completely vain. Vanity. And we'll actually we'll get a little bit further in here. Let's see if we can finish the chapter. Amen? Let's see. Verse 18 goes on now. To whom then will we liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare Him? Compare unto Him. Verse 19. The workman melts a graven image, and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold, and casts silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooses a tree that will not rot, and he seeks unto him a cunning work to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he, he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof as, are as grasshoppers that stretch out the heaven, heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in that bring the princes to nothing. He makes the politicians of the earth <laughs> as vanity. He makes the big shots and big wigs, judges, princes, that's, that's the idea there, to nothing. Verse 24, Yea, they shall not be planted, yea, they, uh, they shall not be sown, yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. Jesus Christ will come when all the nations of the earth gather themselves together against Jerusalem, and ultimately against Him, against God Almighty. It's just going to be a breath. One word. Taken care of. One thing. <laughs> taken care of. But really stopping and thinking about how foolish, how ridiculous idolatry truly is. People that truly will st stay home tonight and turn on this show with a bunch of guys in tights, running around, falling on each other, all over a, a ball, some pigskin, some ball, that they're throwing back and forth. And they go nuts if you catch the ball, or if you're really good at throwing it. I mean, we are such a weird, I mean, idolatry is such a weird, uh, there's no explanation for it. It makes absolutely no sense, and that's that's God's kind of, in verses 18 through 20, 
that we just read through 24, the workman spends all day putting together the gold and the chains. And, and the whole thing is putting and attributing power to an inanimate object or attributing power to something or someone that power ought not to be attributed to. And ultimately, when we make an idol, it lowers my view, it lowers our view of God and who, tr who God truly is. And we end up, Pastor Chuck Smith always said it, you will become whatever it is you worship. You can see that. You can see people that worship sex by the way they dress. You can see it becomes them. That's what they're all about. It's what they, they think about constantly. It's what they're all about. Whatever it is you worship. It could be Pokemon. It could be something, and that's just what you're all about. You start turning yellow and sprouting black dots, you know. You become exactly what you worship. You want to ask, and you want a good example of that, look at India. The, the India, the place that has a rat that they worship. I forget the name of the god, but it's, it's a rat. A big rat. And their whole, one, one whole section of their nation there in India has become a complete just sewer, sewage. They are, they are living there in their own filth, like rats. You become what you worship. Um, and it's, it's what, what, what we're all about. Uh, <laughs> there's no, uh, it makes no sense. Because, and the reason it makes no sense, is nothing compares to the glory of God. I mean, the glory of someone who makes a touchdown... It's silliness. Someone who makes a perfect home run or whatever it might be that we, we kind of enjoy. I'm not saying we can't enjoy football. We can't enjoy baseball or, or basketball or any of these things. No, it's when these things begin to take over and take precedence, especially over Bible study, prayer, worship, fellowship. It's silliness. Um, if you ever need a reminder of these things... Jot it down. Psalms chapter 115. <laughs> Always love this one. Psalms 115. Just the first few verses of Psalms 115. Um, Our God is in heaven, and He has done whatsoever He pleases. Their idols, or lowercase g, gods, are silver, and gold. Not much different than today, by the way. Their gods are silver and gold. The work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. <laughs> they have ears, but they cannot hear. And noses even they have, but they can't smell. They have hands, but they don't handle anything. Feet they have, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. <laughs> they that make them are like unto them. That's where Pastor Chuck got it, by the way. They that make them are like unto them. You become exactly like that thing you are making. And again, we, we, Paul put it this way, we worship the creation rather than the Creator. And you got people worried about a tree and ask them if they're worried about their eternal soul they don't know what to say they're worried about a tree <laughs> and we can be so stupid <laughs> so foolish and it's it's uh, it's important that we understand that well to whom then will I liken me will ye liken me rather God now Verse 25, Who am I like? <laughs> or shall I be equal? Saith the Holy One. Lift up your eyes, and I have that underlined, lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who has created these things? 
that brings out their hosts by number, or the stars. And he calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power. No, uh, not one faileth. Not one what? Star. He knows each and every one. We know a few. We've been, you know, we name them. But compared to him, not one star fall, falls without him knowing about it. Um, why sayest thou, O Jacob, verse 27, and speak, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over uh, from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. How many of you are glad about that? It's, we need that. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's powerful, powerful stuff from the Word of God. And people start out running, don't they, in the, in the faith. They, get, they come to God, they, they give their life to the Lord, and they run, and they don't faint. It's a miracle. But when you start walking, <laughs> when you start walking, that's when, it, when the rubber hits the road, if you will. When real life hits, you've got to get up and go back to the workplace now. The running stops, and you, every, you know, everyone can run for a while, even fly for a while. But that walking, the Lord, and that, that's, we need His, His power. We need His might, His strength. I can't do it. None of us can do it. We can't walk with God. Um. This is an almighty God. It's why we can gather week after week, decade after decade, century after century for some of us. And it's powerful. It's meaningful every time. Because this book is never boring. I, don't, I can't explain it. You go through this stuff and you don't faint. You go through it and you don't get weary. You can even run through it sometimes. Running through Ruth. Yeah. I'm trying to think of those books. That we can do. Yeah. Skipping through Samuel, right? And things like that. But we don't grow weary. We don't faint. We don't get why? Because I decide to lift my eyes. That's why I have that underlined. I hope you underline that. In verse 26, lift up your eyes. This is the answer so often to any problem I may be facing, any issue that I might be up against. It's because I'm not lifting up my eyes. You want to be miserable? All you have, all you have to do is head down, looking, thinking, concerned only about me. Only about yourself. So often, what, what makes all of us miserable? Thinking only about me. Not interested in others. Lift up your eyes. Jesus told His disciples that. So, He told many that He healed. Lift up your eyes. He knew the problem. It was much deeper than they could not physically see. They could not physically hear. They had to lift up their eyes and start looking. Not necessarily at others, but ultimately at God. What is it? John Corson has a great... If I look at others, I get distressed. 
I look at myself, that's a great way to get depressed. If I look at God, if I look up to God, man, I'm blessed. And I can rest. <laughs> it's true. You start looking at others and, oh no, you get distressed. Oh, head down. You start looking at myself, look in, into my own thing. It's a good way to get depressed. But look to God. You look at Him and you're just blessed. You can't get away from it. You're just blessed. Because there's no one greater. Who can compare? Who can compare? A chunk of gold? Are you kidding me? That's what they thought. Things that have eyes that can't see. <laughs> Ears. And that's, again, idolatry, it's so silly because it truly is the most selfish. It really is selfish. I will worship what I want to worship. My way. That's the, it's the ultimate selfish, this whole thing with idols. And, and don't kid yourself, we do worship idols. We do. We got fancier names for them and all that stuff. There's people that worship intellect, people that worship music, people that worship athletes, musicians, if you want to call them that anymore. All you got to do is push the right buttons and you're a musician all of a sudden. <laughs> but, but the things and the people and the stuff that we put up on pedestals, pe people that worship cars, people that worship, you know, you could go list, and, and what's amazing, we could be here till midnight. Don't worry, we won't be. <laughs> we could be here till midnight if you went through the Word of God, if you went through the Bible about all of the times it talks about idolatry. God is concerned about this. In fact, it's part of the Big Ten. The Ten Commandments, right? The, Thou shalt not worship any graven image, any other thing, but always, always look to Him. In fact, you look at the stars, you look at the heavens, you look at the trees. It's beautiful, isn't it? And people worship those things, but they're fading. As beautiful as they are, a flower can be beautiful. It's fading. It's fleeting. It's completely dead. And all those things do, if you look close enough, is declare the glory of God. The heavens declare. The trees, our eyeballs, <laughs> our hands, Everything about us declares the glory of God. It's amazing. Father, we thank You how glorious You are and how Your Word never fails. Your Word truly stands forever. Your Word endures above all other things. And I pray we would just look to You. We would look up at those times we need to look up. And we would be... Um, just trusting You with all our hearts. Lord, we would be turning our attention to You and worshiping You. And when the times of temptation, the times come, Lord, and they will, for us to turn to things, to turn to other idols, no matter what they may be, help us to stand firm and understand that You are the only one who's not temporary. <laughs> You're the only one who stands forever. And you can cause us to stand forever as well. So we surrender all to you. We, we worship you now. Through these last couple of songs, I pray you just speak to our hearts as only you can, Lord. And make this time just an intimate, special time by your Spirit. Let your Spirit lead us.